Good evening. God bless you all. Hallelujah. I'm Apostle Marcos, pastor of Transforming Word Ministries. I want to welcome all of you that are joining with us, those of you that are still calling in. Hallelujah. God bless you. Tonight we're going to be in Matthew chapter 13, and we're going to be talking about the parable of the wheat and the tares. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But before we begin, uh, I'd just like to let everyone know of the availability of a couple of books that I have um, written that are available at lulu.com. That's lulu, L-U-L-U.com. Amen. Uh, here they are here. These are uh, Understanding the Book of Revelation. This is uh, book one. <laughs> and this is book two. Amen. There is just so much involved in, in this book that I had to put them in two different volumes. Amen. And both of these are available at lulu.com. They're fully annotated and um, with uh, comments and line by line study of the book of Revelation. So if you're interested in understanding the book of Revelation, you can order these through lulu.com. Uh, soon they'll be available through other places, online book retailers like Barnes and Nobles and Amazon. But right now, immediately they are available at lulu.com. And if you don't want to wait for the print version, you can also order the ebook. In addition, this is my latest one. And this is the book of Daniel. Amen. Uh, it's based on the, I guess it was about three month study and teaching on the book of Daniel. And like the book of Revelation, it is annotated. It is uh, full of uh, comments, line by line, verse by verse study on the book of Daniel. And everybody knows that the book of Daniel is instrumental, very instrumental in understanding the book of Revelation. Amen. Both of these are available at lulu.com in both print form and in ebook. So if you would like to um, purchase your copy, you can feel free to do so. And I just want to thank you in advance for uh, supporting uh, my ministry. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, let's get started. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Before we begin, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, hallelujah, for teaching us this evening. And Father, as we go forth in your word, we ask that your Holy Spirit, Father, would give us more insight, Father, on your written word regarding the wheat and the tares. Father, I pray that everyone who sees this message and participates in this Bible study would be edified, Father, and that you would be glorified above all things. Holy Spirit, I get out of your way and let everything be done according to your will, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, before we actually begin, just a, a quick overview, how we conduct the Bible study. Amen. Hallelujah. I encourage everybody to have your Bibles ready. Take out a pad and some pens. Write notes. Amen. And um, at the end of the Bible study, we will have a time for questions and answers or comments. So if you have any questions, please write them down as we go along. I have a tendency to move quick, so I try not to keep people too late. Amen. But please write them down. And at the end, we'll have a time that, you know, questions can be answered or comments can be added. Amen. So uh, just to let you know that this is uh, how we conduct it. Amen. So we are going to begin uh, the parable of the wheat and the tares. Now, this parable of the wheat and the tares immediately follows the parable of the sower. And it reveals the hidden truth of the kingdom of heaven. Now, notice that in each of the parables that we've covered so far, which are the parable of the sower, the parable of the growing seed, the parable of the vineyard, and last week's the parable of the budding fig tree, there's a common theme. Seeds are being planted 
and growing into mature um, trees or plants like its parent tree. And throughout this process, there is opposition that attempts to prevent the seed from reaching maturity and bearing fruit. So now you may recall that where we covered that the kingdom of heaven, once it's purged of all corruption, becomes the kingdom of God. And this parallels the seed being planted, um, the seed that eventually, oh, that what eventually grows from the seed, um, producing fruit. Now, the seed that's being planted and what eventually grows from the seed are not one and the same. I mean, everybody knows that you can plant an apple seed and it will grow into an apple tree. But the apple tree and the apple seed are not the same, though they came from the same source. So this illustrates the process of transformation. And that's the Greek word, and we may be familiar with this, metamorphosis. Amy? We're very familiar with the process as we see it illustrated in the insect kingdom. For example, um, larvae uh, transform into caterpillars which then transform into its final form as a butterfly. We see this kind of thing happening all the time. Now, the parable of the sower in Mark chapter 14 tells us that the seed that's planted is the word of God. And this compares to the larvae stage. Those who believe the gospel are added to the kingdom of heaven and they begin to spiritually mature. And this compares to the caterpillar stage. Hallelujah. Once we are added to the kingdom of heaven and Christ returns, we'll be transformed from this physical world to the spiritual world in the kingdom of God. That's the final stage, and this compares to the final stage of a butterfly. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven, we can see and perceive, is the immature stage, and the kingdom of God is the final mature stage. Mm. Now, we're going to discuss this more in our next teaching on the parable of he um, of the leaven. I keep saying heaven. <laughs> We're going to discuss that in the parable of the leaven. But this parable, the parable of the wheat and tares, is explained further in Matthew chapter 13, verses 36 through 43. So we're not going to have to spend that much time deciphering it. Hallelujah. God bless you, Sister Cynthia, Sister Cordelia. God bless you. We are just about ready to start. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 13. We're going to start with verse 24 on the parable of the wheat and the tares. And this is probably one of the uh, more familiar parables uh, in the church. Verse 24. Another parable put Jesus forth unto his disciples saying, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed or scattered good seed. And where was this done? In his field. Now, this is a description of the present, immature stage of the kingdom of heaven. The man who sowed the seed is Christ, and the good seed is defined by the apostle Peter. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, um, you don't have to go there, I'll read that. Peter says, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, it's a capital S, so it's talking about the Holy Spirit, unto unfeigned or sincere 
love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed. And how? By the word of God. And the word of God is the good seed that's planted by Christ, which liveth and abideth forever. Hallelujah. Amen. Remember, scripture, and we should always allow scripture to interpret scripture and not lean to our contemporary understanding. Because if we substitute our contemporary understanding for a biblical concept, we will always miss it and be wrong. So therefore, as we can see, it is the word or the logos of God that enables us to be born again. And the logos is God's ideas and concepts. Amen. We covered that last week. Hallelujah. It's not the King James Version scripture in our Bibles repeated verbatim. It's the thought behind the words, because the words convey the meaning of the thought. Hallelujah. So the good seed represents the children of the current kingdom of heaven that we're in now. And the field represents the world, which is the cosmos. More accurately, or quite simply, it's human society, which has been corrupted by sin. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 13, picking up with verse 25. Jesus continues and says, but while men slept, meaning they were unaware or indifferent, his enemy came. And this tells us that the man is fully aware of who his enemy, who's his opposer, opposing him, resisting him. He knows, fully aware, who this person is. And quite simply, if we allow scripture to interpret scripture, we know as well. He is the original rebel against God, which is Lucifer. As I've stated in other places and other teachings, we know him as Satan and the devil, but those are not proper names. His proper name is Lucifer. And the names, the names devil and Satan are actually descriptions of the methods or the mode that he functions in. Satan means adversary or enemy. And devil means accuser. We're going to get into this in just a little bit. But let's continue. His enemy came and sowed the seeds of tares among the wheat and went his way. See, the tares were not sown fully grown. Just like the seeds of the wheat were sown, the seeds of the tares were sown in this place. So in this parable, the good seed is not the word of God itself, but the results which the word has produced, which are the children of the kingdom. Hmm. Now, remember, we were just talking about stages, like with the butterfly. Larvae becomes a caterpillar, which then becomes a butterfly. And each stage, each transformation, each stage of metamorphosis is permanent. We've never seen a butterfly go back to being a caterpillar, just like we've never seen a pickle go back to being a cucumber. Each stage is permanent. Each transformation is permanent. Look at the words now, children of the kingdom. Obviously, this is a stage also because we are all born babies. I mean, there's, there's a lot that goes on before we're actually born, but once we're born into this world, we're born babies. 
And then we grow and transform into children. And then we reach the final stage of maturity called adulthood. So we see here they are the children of the kingdom. The kingdom of what? The kingdom of heaven. The immature stage of children in the immature stage of the kingdom of heaven. Mm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God bless you, Brother Willie. God bless you. Welcome. We are in Matthew chapter 13. And we're going to see, you know, John talks about this same um, thing about um, stages. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, the Apostle John says, And now, little children, abide in Christ, that when Christ shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. You know that Christ is righteous. You know or if you know that Christ is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. So this illustrates where the seed comes from. I once heard Dr. C. Dexter Wise say something very profound. He said that apples are not food for the apple tree because nobody's ever seen an apple tree eat an apple. The fruit of the apple that we like to eat contains seeds and the fruit of the apple, the flesh of the apple is actually food for the seed so that the seed can grow into an adult tree just like its parent. Mm. So now we see what these seeds are that come from Christ, what they are meant to do. They are meant to cause the person that these seeds are planted in to grow and mature and transform, but we can't transform ourselves. We are to be transformed into an earthly representation of Christ. The King James Version calls it the image of Christ. Hallelujah. So we see that wheat symbolizes, again, the children of the kingdom of God, but we are currently the immature sprouts of wheat in the immature stage called the kingdom of heaven. We have not yet reached maturity. Mm, I, I'm praying that somebody can see this. Now, notice that the enemy sowed the tares while men slept. This was done in human society where unbelievers are oblivious to the goings on in the spiritual world. Remember, the field represents the cosmos or corrupt human society. As Paul would state, uh, he stated in 1 Corinthians, I believe, chapter 2, where it says that the natural man cannot receive the things of God. And he tells us why. Because the things of God are spiritually discerned. They can only be noticed, perceived, and understood spiritually. The Holy Spirit teaches us these things transforms us into, into a representation of Christ. And it is through the Holy Spirit that our spirit is able to perceive the things of God. Unbelievers are cut off from God, out of fellowship from God, alienated and hostile to God. Therefore, they are to God dead, spiritually dead. Amen. And it is not until we hear the gospel that we can become spiritually alive and in fellowship with God through the Holy Spirit. 
Unsaved people are oblivious to what is going on around them in the spiritual world. So this is what the scripture is saying while men slept. This happened. Believers can be made aware of tears, but unbelievers know nothing about it. However, Satan's activity is seen where the children of the kingdom bear fruit. Ah, again, tares outwardly profess to be children of the kingdom, outwardly, but they have no submission to Christ. Therefore, they're not really children. I remember somebody once said to me, we're all God's children. And that's not true. We're not God's children until we believe the gospel and the Holy Spirit begins to transform us into God's children. But we're not meant to remain God's children forever. We are eventually meant to grow and mature. So this tells us that there's a difference between a child of God and a man or woman of God. See the different stages that we're talking about. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God bless you, Brother Charles. Welcome. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 13. We're picking up with verse 26. Jesus continues and says, but when the blade was sprung up or when it sprouted, and this is an indication of growth and that time has passed. We know you don't plant a seed today and 30 seconds later, it, something starts growing up out of the ground. Time has passed. Amen. When the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, these are the results that were expected based on the type of seed that they came from. Again, this is another indication that time has passed. You see, we can read that right out of the scripture if we simply place ourselves in that position as if we're watching it with our eyes and perceiving what it is that we're looking at based on what the scripture says and some good old Christian common sense. He says, when it brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. Ah, this tells us that the tares were exposed by the type of fruit that they brought forth. Hmm. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 16, that we will know them by their fruit. We know anybody according to the fruit or the results that they bring. Tares and wheat, and we're talking naturally now because tear is a, is a type of weed. Tares and wheat are identical when they're young, but when they're fully grown and when they're harvested, the tares give off a very bitter, noxious taste and they have an intoxicating effect and they can be poisonous, I guess, if you ate enough. So now we can see more clearly what the tares represent. Toxic people. We do a lot of talking about people that are always, you know, causing people to be uncomfortable, people you don't want to be around, people that are always causing problems, always causing mess and nonsense, and you just don't want to be around them. Tears, and we're talking about the plant itself, tears are inherently toxic. It's their nature and their behavior is ingrained in them. So now let's transfer that to the people that they represent. Their behavior is inherently toxic. They look, they appear like other Christian believers. They go to church. They shout hallelujah. 
They throw money at the altar like it's going to change anything for them, just like everybody else. But it is their behavior that identifies the seed that was planted in them. So we see there's two different types of seeds we're talking about. One is planted by Christ. That's the gospel, the seed of the kingdom of God that grows inside believers of Christ. The other is not of Christ. And we're given a description here of the effect that it has on other people. Mm. This seed that was planted in the tares is what they have experienced that has affected their emotional and their psychological development. People are not born evil. I believe just like babies, we're all born neutral, but it is the corruption that, we, that is part of our nature, but it is the corruption is learned and we learn to act upon it when there are no checks and balances. That's why we can see that when you have, let's say, a parent in a supermarket, and I'm sure many of us have experienced this, and their child, little Johnny or little Susie, doesn't want to behave, and instead of correcting them quickly and firmly, the parent kind of lets it slide. Oh, no, don't do that. And meanwhile, the child's yelling, screaming, kicking at them, sometimes even cursing at them, spitting at their own parent, and will not submit themselves to their parent's authority. Hmm. That type of behavior is learned. Amen? We all are born with the tendency to be rebellious, but... It is the act of rebellion that we learn when we try to do it and are allowed to get away with it. So this tells us a lot about tears. Amen. It's what they have experienced that has affected their emotional and psychological development. And we refer today as people that are messy or people with issues. Mm, and there are plenty of people like that in the church today. They are what I call functionally dysfunctional. And their issues, though they are hidden most of the time, they often rise to the surface at different times. Some people have, I guess psychologists call it stressors. You know, some things that just push their buttons. And for everybody, it's different. You know, some people may not, you know, like uh, shoelaces untied. And when they see shoelaces untied, they just flip out. And you would look at them and wonder, why are you getting so excited over untied shoelaces? See, to them, it's a serious issue. But to us, we look at it as that's really not so serious. So we see, again, it's that emotional and psychological development because of the seed that was planted in them. So now notice that the activity of the tares never stop the wheat from bearing fruit. We can't miss that part. And this fruit is what exposed the presence of the tares. Hallelujah. This means that the tares, remember, they give off a noxious, bitter taste. The tares tainted the flavor of the wheat. So we're talking about the wheat's results. What the wheat did was tainted by the flavor of the tare. What are we talking about? It's the dysfunctional behavior of the tear that can overpower the good of the wheat, making the, the results of the wheat useless, so bitter that no one can be blessed by them. 
Hmm. If we were to use an analogy, I like oatmeal. It's like strong tasting salt. Now, a little is good in oatmeal. A little more strong taste in salt is noticeable, but we can tolerate it. Too much salt makes the oatmeal so salty, it's unbearable, and the oatmeal is now inedible. We can't do anything with it but throw it away. So this is a way of saying that the dysfunctional behavior of people, of some people, can cast a negative reflection over an entire ministry. Hmm. You know, you can have, um, let's say, a pastor who is anointed, blessed in the word. People hear his teaching and his preaching, and they really are, are blessed and edified by it. However, let's say one of his ministers has issues and it comes forth in that person's demeanor, things they do, the way they react, comments that they make, and it turns people off. That minister's demeanor and behavior, his conduct or her conduct, can get to the point where it overpowers the good of the pastor and turns so many people off that they would rather just not come to that church, even though that pastor can be a blessing. What comes along with it is something that they just can't deal with. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. God bless you, Brother Charles. That's right. Racism as well. Amen. You have a lot of people, especially in this day and age, that try and hide that. But it always is just under the surface and it will come out in different ways. Amen. Absolutely right. Hallelujah. Let's go back to verse 27 of Matthew chapter 13. And let's continue. Jesus continues and says, so the servants of the householder, and these are God's servants. And as we covered in the previous parables, the servants are, are the prophets. So God's servants are those that are devoted to his will, and they're those who mind and focus on the things of God. So building on the symbols that we used in the other, or that we learned of, I should say, in the other parables, the servants are the New Testament prophets of God. They're not people that, you know, want to tell you your fortune and predict the future and, oh, I see this in your future and I see you doing this and so on and so forth. It, it, no, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about those that edify, that exhort, that comfort using the anointing of the Holy Spirit to do so. These are the spiritually mature people within the fivefold ministry. It can apply to anybody in ministry or any lay person that the Holy Spirit can use. So it's not limited to the fivefold ministry, but generally this is what it's referring to. The servants of God. Servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? Well, from whence has it tears? In other words, you didn't plant this in your field, so where are they coming from? Now, let's look at something. The Greek word that's translated as householder is the Greek word oiki despotes. I said it wrong. Oiki. <laughs> oiko despotes. Close enough. And it more accurately translates to the head of family. Ah, oh. so since Christ is sowing the seed, this tells us that Christ is the head of the family of the children that are growing 
in the immature stage called the kingdom of heaven. Mm. We have heard that phrase before, the family of God. Notice that it was the spiritually mature servants of God, amen, that discerned the presence of tares, and they did it by comparing the results of the tares with the results of the wheat. They compared the two. Now, in terms of people, this is observing the effect that their behavior has on other people and as the, on the ministry as a whole, how they make you feel. You know, and I, I'm sure I don't have to tell anybody, but we know there are some people that can be a joy to be around, that we like being around them. They make us laugh. They make us feel light like there's no burden and no weight on our shoulders. You know, it's it's a joy to be around them. We look forward to being around them. And then there's other people that you just, uh, I love you with the love of the Lord, but I got to love you from a distance. Hmm. I remember, because none of us were born saved, so let's not get this twisted. I remember Sly and the Family Stone sang a song called Family Affair. And in this, he's describing two different sons that came from the same parent. One is a son that loves to learn, and the other is somebody that you just love to burn. So here we see again in everyday common examples around us, examples of wheat and tares. Somebody you love, somebody you like being around, somebody you like to help, somebody you like to interact with and fellowship with, and somebody, if I never saw you again, I, I, God bless you, wish you well, but I'd be just as fine not being around you anymore because of the effect that you have on me. You make me feel uncomfortable. You make me feel bad about myself. You know, you never have nothing good to say. There's always a problem. Hmm. And it's always a problem with other people, but never with you. You see, we've all experienced that, I'm very sure. So we see that there is this difference, this, this um, two sides to a coin. And unbelievers cannot perceive this disparity because unbelievers have nothing to compare it to. That's right. Corruption does not perceive corruption as being corrupt. Corrupt people can only see corruption as being normal. Mm. This tells us that we need the presence of the Holy Spirit to show us the difference. This is why Jesus said to Nicodemus that unless you're born again, you cannot see or perceive the kingdom of heaven. It's impossible because you have nothing to compare it to. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is why unbelievers don't see anything wrong, but mature believers can see it. And it's not about being judgmental either. It's about seeing the truth for what it is and how it's operating. Amen. Amen, Brother Charles. Discernment. That's exactly the word that it is. Hallelujah. So what does this say about people in today's church who do wrong and know that they're doing wrong, but they use that judging others as a defense? Don't judge me. We're not supposed to judge. They expose themselves as being a dull piece of iron that needs to be sharpened but refuses to be sharpened. Iron sharpens iron. Hallelujah. So as we read in let me turn off my phone here for just a second. I forgot to turn it off. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Amen. As we read in Matthew chapter 13, verse 25, unbelievers and believers that refuse correction are spiritually asleep, which means that they're lazy and indifferent towards their salvation. This is really the only definition that can be applied to it. If you know that sin is what has separated man from God, Indulging and regularly engaging in sin, habitual sin, does the same thing. And doing so will separate anybody from God, even a believer. Fortunately, we can ask for forgiveness and be restored. However, if we don't want to be corrected, if we don't want anybody judging us, having anything to say about us, you mind your own business, you, you take care of yourself, but you can't tell me nothing. That is allowing that person to continue in actions and behaviors that will separate them from God. And that's not good. That's a mild way of putting it, but that's not good at all. Amen? So it's the lazy and those that are indifferent towards God's business that don't even notice the tears. And why is this? Well, that answer is found in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14, which tells us, but strong meat, which is advanced or deeper teachings of God's truth, belongeth to them that are of full age, mature, even those who by reason of use of what? Of strong meat, deeper truths of God, have their senses exercised to discern or distinguish both good and evil. Mm. This shows us that the deeper teachings of God help us to see the difference between good and evil when it appears, amen? It's not talking about being able to spot a devil a mile away or to see a, a demon in a crowd of people. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the inherent, intrinsic good or evil of any thing or any situation. Hmm. You get into situations and we sometimes can't tell if it's a good thing or if it's a bad thing. It is the deeper teachings of God that help us to be able to perceive this by looking ahead at the fruit that this situation will bear in our lives or bear in other people's lives. Will it bring God glory? Will it edify us or the other person? If the answers are no, then it's not good. And it's the word of God, not the basics of the word, but the deeper teachings of the word of God that help us to be able to perceive this. But these teachings are not for new converts, for baby Christians as it's some people, some people sometimes called. It's for those that are mature of age, fully grown spiritually, or at least more advanced. Amen? Because none of us ever arrive. But there are some that are more mature than others in Christ. Amen? It's just being honest, and it's the truth, and there's nothing wrong with acknowledging that. Amen? So the immature that are still on the basics or the milk of the word, amen, hallelujah, are those that are still immature and they're unskillful in using the word of God. And why is that? 
because they don't apply it. They don't use it. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. God bless. That's right, Brother Charles. Lasciviousness as well. Amen. The immature are unskillful in the deeper teachings relating to God's standards of rightness, which is righteousness. Amen. And this is because they don't apply it. They can't apply it because they're not at a position where they can understand it yet. Hallelujah. We can't apply what we don't know. And this is why it's imperative for all of us to grow beyond the simple stage of the uh, simple truths and basics of the word. There's much more to the word of God than Christ crucified. Much, much, much more. This is not to lessen the importance of Christ's sacrifice on the cross, but it doesn't begin there and it doesn't end there. There's so much more that we can learn from and grow from. Amen. But if we simply focus on the basics of the word of God and nothing more, we can then say that our spiritual development has been retarded. It has been stunted. We're not as advanced as we should be considering the amount of teaching that is available. And this exposes something else. There are some ministries that either cannot or will not teach more advanced teachings in their ministry. I was once in a ministry, which shall remain nameless, amen, but the teaching was the basics, the milk of the word. And there were some of us that were more advanced that had approached the pastor at separate times requesting more advanced teaching for those that were ready for it and those that wanted it. And the response was that they were satisfied with the level of teaching in the ministry, which was definitely geared towards new converts. So this means that those that were not new converts that had been walking with the Lord seven or eight years and were hungry for more were being left to spiritually starve because while they were ready for meat, and they were able to digest meat, they were still being spoon-fed baby food. This shows us that if we have people that have been walking with the Lord 10, 12, 15 years, but they are still on the milk of the word, either that person refuses to grow or the place where they're in is not conducive to their growth. They're not being taught what they need at the level that they happen to be at. Again, that's like forcing a teenager to eat pablum. Oh, it'll fill your stomach, but it has very little nutritional value. And even if your stomach may be full, you're still starving because the nutrients that you need that would help your body to grow and remain strong, you're not getting. Hallelujah. I didn't really mean to get into this, but it's part of this parable of the wheat and the tares. Amen. We can see a lot of that is applicable to this particular parable. But Let's move on. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 13. Let's go. We're continuing with verse 28. Hallelujah. The householder said unto the servants that came to him, an enemy has done this. When they asked him how you didn't plant these seeds of the tares in your field, where'd they come from? How'd they get up in here? He says an enemy has done this. Now, here is something that is lost in the translation. Remember when we, we talked about 
studying with a concordance and with a lexicon, not skipping over words, because the concordance will tell you what the word means, whether it's literal, whether it's used figuratively, if it's a figure of speech or a euphemism that's particular to the Hebrew language or to the Greek language. Something that's lost in translation here. This word, enemy, in the Greek language is ekthros, but it is compounded with the word anthropos. That's where we get our English word anthropology. It's the study of man. This word is compounded with anthropos, amen? And this can only be seen if you're using a concordance. It's not there, it's literally hidden in the translation into English. So this tells us that the tear is the result of an ekthros anthropos, or a human enemy. Mm. This is a person that is acting under the influence of the enemy of Christ. God uses people. And Lucifer also uses people. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It is the will of the enemy of God that these seeds were planted, but they are carried out through people that submit to the influence of God's enemy. Human enemy. Hmm. And that is Lucifer. Further on in Matthew chapter 13 at verse 39, Lucifer is identified as operating in his function as the devil. Again, that's not a proper name. It describes his function. It's an adjective. It's also a noun. But here it's used as an adjective describing what it is that he does. Devil is the Greek word diabolos, and it means a slanderer or a false accuser. Ah, this identifies the bad seed that was planted in the person. Assassination of their character, demoralization, humiliation, false accusations that affected them emotionally, causing them to become a tear along with the dysfunctional and toxic behavior associated with it. Mm. Hallelujah. Amen. Their perception has been distorted by lies and false accusations against them to the point that it has become ingrained in their nature making them dysfunctional, even though to them, they're perfectly fine. As we saw earlier, the purpose of all of this is to hinder or, or limit the effectiveness of the church in the world because the, the, the behavior of the tear is seen when the children of the kingdom or the wheat bear fruit. Once you see one, you have something to compare it to when you see the other. It's like we can't tell what a counterfeit $20 bill looks like unless we know what a real 24, authentic, $20 bill looks like. Amen. You can't spot the counterfeit unless you know what the authentic looks like. Once the authentic is brought forth through the wheat, we're then able to spot the counterfeit through the tear. Even though they're both in the same place, sitting under the same leadership, maybe even of the same household. Hmm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If any of us remembers, you know, we've seen movies, you know, of, of um, people 
in um, urban um, cities and developments and in the projects, the PJs, where you have the, the prototypical, what you call the ghetto mother, that tells their child, you're just like your father. He ain't no good. And you ain't no good. And you ain't never going to be nothing just like your father. That is a seed that is then planted in that child. Distorting that child's perception of themselves. Mm. To the point where they either fight to overcome it or they fight to reinforce what they think they should be based on the seed that was planted in them. That's tremendous emotional and psychological damage done to a person. And when they grow up, their behavior is so natural and normal to them, they can't see what it is that they do to other people and what it is that they've been doing to themselves. Hallelujah. You know, it brings back to mind the word of Jeremiah that says that he his his ministry was to uproot that which has been planted of course you wouldn't need to uproot something that's good bearing fruit that's beneficial when you uproot something you're getting rid of it because there's something wrong with it hmm and it's the word of god that exposes us to us the things in us that don't smell so good, that rub people the wrong way. And that, that applies to all of us, all of us. Sometimes all of us at different times get a little too flip with the lip, you know what I mean? Too quick with the mouth. We may joke and mean it as a joke, but we don't realize how it affects other people. It's the word of God that helps us identify that behavior and uprooted out of our own hearts. Amen. But the tares behavior is so ingrained in them based on the seed planted, the lies, demoralization, making people feel small and insignificant, making them feel like trash, that they grow up thinking that's what they are and that their behavior is normal. That is such a sad situation, and it's also very dangerous, not only for them, but for the people they interact with. Dysfunctional. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's continue. Hallelujah. Verse 28. Let's finish the balance of 28. The servants said unto the householder, once he told them that an enemy is the one that has planted these seeds, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, nay, in no uncertain terms, no. And this is the reason. Lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. What does he mean by this? Again, let's put ourselves in that situation and perceive what we would see if we were actually there. Their response is a common emotional response. Expose and get rid of it. We don't need it here. But there's a reason why it's not allowed. The behavior of a tear is just like the behavior of an immature believer. And it's impossible for man to determine which is which. We're not to make assumptions that because we see that behavior, that that person's automatically a tear. They could simply be an immature believer who still thinks like the world and needs time for the Holy Spirit to begin to transform them. Because not everybody in Christ is at the same level in Christ. Mm. A slow maturing Christian can be misidentified as a tear. And it's always possible 
that a tear can be spiritually delivered from emotional influences that influence their behavior. They can be delivered from it. Hallelujah. And in addition, if we accidentally uproot some wheat, believing it to be a tear, we destroy any potential future fruit from that person. And that's the intention that Lucifer has in the first place. That would be playing right into his hands. Hmm. Verse 30. Here the householder instructs the servants, let both tares and the wheat grow together until the harvest, which is identified in verse 39 as the end of this physical world age. We're talking about the natural realm, which will then be replaced with the spiritual realm just as the kingdom of heaven, once purged of all corruption, becomes the kingdom of God. Mm. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. This burning in fire, it symbolizes the eternal separation from the presence of God in the lake of fire, which you can read about in Revelation chapter 20. Amen. That's a figurative description that the apostle John gives regarding what he saw in this separation. Amen. But it was described as being a lake. Now, again, put yourself in John's shoes. He's standing up and he sees a big area in front of him and people being cast into it. From his perspective, it could look like a lake. So it's just a description. But what it is, again, it's the method or the means by which God will rid the earth of all corruption and sin through this lake of fire, purifying the kingdom of heaven, and thus it then transforms into the kingdom of God. Amen. So this is what's being talked about, gather the tares and burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn, which symbolizes the kingdom of God. Now, people may look at this and say burning them. Well, that's talking about burning forever in hellfire. Not true. Because if you actually read the book of Revelation, it tells us that in Revelation chapter 20, that death and hell, hell was emptied of all the souls that were in it, being incarcerated up until that time. It was empty of all of it. And then death and hell were both cast into this lake of fire, which means that hell was empty. So there is no burning forever in hell fire. There will come an end to that particular incarceration for some people in hell. However, what happens after that through the lake of fire is much, much worse than hell. I mean, it's hard for us to imagine what hell is like. So it's definitely hard for us to imagine what can be worse than that. But the word of God tells us this is worse. The eternal separation from God without any other chance for redemption, permanent, game over, no overtime. That is worse than being in hell. It may be hard to fathom and understand, but you know what? Just that little piece of information itself is enough for me to say, I don't want to experience that. Hopefully it's enough for all of you that are watching this video as well. Hallelujah. But let's continue. Matthew chapter 13, verse 42 tells us that in this lake of fire, there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth, euphemisms, figures of speech, 
What do they mean? Weeping is an expression of intense emotional and mental pain that will never end or ease. Now, that's torment. The extreme emotion of sadness being eternally released without end or relief, just constantly flowing out, but never lessening. Gnashing of teeth is the expression of rage and indignation, which would then be focused at God because that person would blame God for them being in a situation that they're in, even though it's their own fault. But it's that expression of rage with no relief, and um, this intensity of anger will never be satisfied. I mean, we've all we're all human. We've all been angry, and some have been furious. We know that anger causes us mental exhaustion. You know, after you're angry for a long time, you just get so tired. You're just tired of being angry. And all of that subsides. It's, it, it's let go. Amen. Imagine raging uncontrolled for all eternity. Not me. Not me. Imagine venting all of our lifetimes, pent up frustrations, but never getting to the point that it has been released. This is what they will experience once they are eternally separated from the presence of God. Jesus instructs us not to separate toxic people from believers. And we're talking about in the church. Amen. This means, it, it doesn't mean to excommunicate them, or throw them out the church. It doesn't mean that. However, the Apostle Paul instructs that we are to take note of them and not to have intimate fellowship with them or to have intimate fellowship with willfully disorderly people and for ourselves to remain orderly and in right standing with God. Again, that's loving people from a distance. Amen. Praying for their deliverance. And if they allow the Holy Spirit to work on them, it's just a matter of time until that behavior then begins to change. For some people, it may take longer than others. Let's take a look at a couple of scriptures. Hallelujah. Amen, Brother Charles. Jonah talked about the bars, about the bars closed behind him. I'll have to take a look at that. I'm, I'm not picking up exactly what you're talking about right away. But let's turn to Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to read verses 13, uh, 17 through 19, where Paul tells the, the Philippians, Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as you have us for an example, which is a living example of godly behavior. Verse 18, for many walk or live a lifestyle of whom I have told you often and I now uh, tell you, even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction. We just talked about that type of destruction. Whose God is their belly. This is another figure of speech and it refers to satisfying the desires of their corrupt nature and whose glory is in their shame who mind earthly things as opposed to minding spiritual things and God's business. He tells the, Thess the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother he didn't say every person, but every brother, which indicates that this is a person that proclaims to be a believer of Christ. They're saved. Withdraw yourself from every brother 
that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he received of us. In other words, this person has been taught proper standards of godly behavior for us believers of God, but still doesn't do it. Mm, that means that their behavior is seen in the church and quite possibly affects other church members. He tells Timothy, whom he sent to be the pastor of the church at Corinth, which was a notoriously carnal church. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 19, he tells Timothy, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal or, or seal of authenticity. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Iniquity is not just sin. It's the habitual practice of refusing to be governed by or to submit to any established law. I'm just going to do me. I don't care what anybody got to say. I'm going to do what I want to do. I don't care who it hurts. I don't care how wrong it is. That is iniquity, but not just a one-time thing here and there, but habitual. They know it's wrong, and they insist on doing it anyway. Hallelujah. So now in closing, amen, we try not to go too long. It's important to note that the growing of the tares did not stop the wheat from bearing fruit. We can't emphasize this enough. This means that though there may be toxic, emotionally unbalanced people in our congregations, it does not negate our responsibility to spiritually mature and to be living examples of holiness and dedication to God, to these tares and to unbelievers that are outside the church. Mm. We are the church. It's not the four walls that we gather in. That's a place. But we are living examples of Christ walking throughout this earth, showing through example the kingdom of God, the love of Christ. Amen. So we're to be living examples. We, it doesn't absolve us of any responsibility to continue doing what we're supposed to be doing. Remember what Jesus said to Peter when he looked at John after, after Christ told Peter, feed my sheep. And he looked at John, he said, well, what about him? Jesus said, to paraphrase, it's not any of your business what I told him. If I said that he should live forever until I return, that's not your concern. You do what I told you to do. You focus on your job, your assignment. Do what you're supposed to do and don't worry about other people. Amen. So we still have to continue doing what it is that God has called us to do. And this is the reason why, as representatives of God, we must have high behavioral standards in place for those who would minister in any capacity, any capacity. Amen. Hallelujah. It's not just about, you know, the pastor. Any capacity from the choir and the choir director on down to the ushers at the door. Amen. You know, we, we you hear all kinds of stories about, you know, nasty people at the door and ushers that don't know how to talk to people and so on and so forth. Amen. There must be high behavior, behavioral standards in place. Toxic and unruly behavior sends a poor message to both the unsaved person that may come to church for the first time 
And it also sends a poor message to new converts about the kingdom of God. It gives the wrong impression. Amen. High standards must be in place. And nobody that's in ministry should be allowed to hide behind, don't judge me, or we're not to judge other people, because that's nonsense. The church is to judge itself, but the church is not to judge unbelievers. That's God's job. Our job is to police ourselves using the word of God as the final standard, not our opinions. Amen. So while the tears are not to be removed, the emotionally unbalanced person should not be put in a position to minister until there is evidence of some kind of deliverance in them from the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, this concludes our teaching for this evening. I really don't know what time it's. Oh, it's just about on time. Amen. Do we have any um, questions or any comments, anything that anybody would like to add? God bless you, Brother Cornell. God bless you. Welcome. Amen. Do we have anybody that has any questions you'd like to add? If you just want to say, hey, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Is there anyone before we close for the evening? Hallelujah. Well, while anybody is, is getting their comments or questions together. Um, some that may have logged on late may have missed it. So I'll just repeat it before we close for the evening. Um, I have my books that are available. Amen. Um, the Understanding the Book of Revelation. This is book one and book two. Amen. They, um, I had released uh, these books three years ago, but after three years more of study, Amen. I had to revise these books. So they've both been revised with over a hundred additional pages each. Amen. And they're both available at lulu.com. They will be available soon in other online locations like Barnes and Nobles, Amazon, and so on and so forth. It's a process that we have to go through before it can get to that point. But they are available right now at lulu.com. And if you order from lulu.com, you can get a 20% discount that you won't get from any other place. Amen. And my newest book is a fully annotated and full of commentary, line by line, chapter by chapter study on the book of Daniel. Let me see. I'm making sure that you can get a good look at that. Amen. This is the cover. Amen. And again, this is about close to 400 pages. And this is a uh, from my study that I recently did on the book of Daniel. And this is also available at lulu.com. And if you'd rather the ebook, they are also available at lulu.com. You can order it, download it right away. Me, I like taking it wherever I go. And, you know, sometimes a tablet or a cell phone can run out of energy and die on you. Well, these books, amen. And this is not, you know, like, you know, um, wide margins with large fonts, double space, take up a lot of room. This is, it's, it's a lot and it's a lot to, um, to digest. So it's something that you should go through very slowly and take your time with it. But if you would like to order it, it's available right now at lulu.com. And uh, if you'd rather, if you don't want to wait for the print, you can also download the ebook right away. It should be available in other online locations within the next four to five weeks. So if you don't want to wait, they're available for you. And I just want to thank any of you in advance that um, would like to support my ministry. And I pray that these books do edify you in your study of the word of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God bless you, brother Stanley. Hallelujah. God bless you. Amen. God bless you. God bless you, sister Cynthia. Thank you. Amen. Us. God bless you. Amen. Well, if we don't have any questions or anything, any other comments for this evening, let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you and we honor you. We give you praise, honor, and glory for this teaching this evening, Father, how your Holy Spirit has moved freely, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We thank you for opening our understanding even more, Father, 
to this parable of the wheat and the tares and helping us to understand the hurt that may have been inflicted on other people to help us understand why people behave the way that they do and to be able to identify some things in us, Lord, that need correction. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your, your multi-layered manifold wisdom, Father, for allowing the tares to continue to grow alongside of the wheat because you know whether or not they will be saved eventually and we don't. We're not to make assumptions as to who you have approved of in advance. So Father, we thank you. We give you praise, honor, and glory, and I pray for everyone that has joined with us and those that are watching this video, that they may be blessed by it and that you would receive all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, I want to thank all of you that called in and joined. Didn't think it a robbery of your time to go through the word of God with us. Amen. By God's grace, we will be back next week as we continue our parables of Christ with the parable of the leaven. Amen. There's a lot in that parable that only recently I've come to understand in looking really deeply into it. Amen. I'm not going to go any further. Amen. So join with us next week. Invite a friend to join with you as we uh, continue to grow in God's word. This is not about building transforming word ministries. It's about edifying the body of Christ. Amen. Christ is returning. You and I know that but people outside the church don't. So we've got to do what we got to do to be able to reach them and that we ourselves are ready for when he returns. It's a done deal and it's going to happen. So it's our best interest to be ready for it when it does. Amen. So God bless you. We'll be back 8.30 p.m. Eastern time next week. If you live in a different time zone, a different state, different country, please make sure to take that time difference into consideration so as not to miss anything. Amen. Watching the video is one thing, but joining with us is a whole nother level. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, God bless all of you. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Be blessed. And remember, Prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. Have a blessed week. We'll see you next time in Jesus' name. Good night, everybody.